Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, good double feature for you today. Uh, good quirky books by some uh, great artists. Uh, we've had uh, them on before. Uh, we're going to start things off with uh, Riley Brown. Riley is doing some really interesting work for Marvel. Uh, he's doing the digital comic with Fred Van Lenty on uh, Sidekick. Uh, first issue had uh, come out this week, but uh, really funny stuff. And eventually it's going to be a paper book as well. But uh, it's interesting to see uh, Sidekick uh, kind of in the mercenary role. Uh, the first issue is a team up with Spider Man. Very funny stuff. He also does a really interesting uh, feature for um, Ghost Tech. Ghost Tech is the cell phone uh, case company, and uh, they've got a great book, uh, Dash Hudson, Tentacles of the Trident, a very funny uh, spy comedy that uh, you can read at ghosttechproducts.com. It's, uh, it's a free virtual graphic novel. Riley's about three-quarters of the way done on it. It is a great story, tremendous art. And uh, we talk about you know digital art because that's kind of Riley's thing that uh, he's become known for, and uh, always interesting to get his uh, view on uh, how things are progressing as far as digital comics go. And uh, also now taking a big step, co-writing with Fred Van Lenty on Slapstick. So we talk about those projects in Hour 1 of Word Balloon. Then we're going to talk to Ryan Dunlevy, who's been on the show a million times, but mostly in convention interviews. It's my first straight-up um, one-on-one with Ryan. Ryan uh, is uh, famous for action philosophers and action presidents, also with Fred Van Lenty, and more importantly, the comic book history of comics, which I have been loving since uh, they started putting out themselves, and then uh, IDW uh, got involved and uh, helped them out and put out the first trade. Well, now this great black-and-white series is coming out in color. In addition to that, they are doing new material for it as well and really expanding uh, their coverage because, you know, the comic book history, when you think about it, is pretty vast. And uh, they covered a lot. But it's interesting to see them uh, kind of expand and the directions they're going in. I think everyone will be pleased. Uh, we also talk about some other projects that uh, Ryan has going on, uh, some of which uh, even involve uh, today's uh, political world and uh, really neat stuff. But uh, Ryan and Riley both very innovative artists who uh, know how to use their skills beyond waiting for that next comic book job. And I think uh, their stories are interesting to share, and I'm happy to bring them both to you today on Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. We've got great uh, books this week from InStock Trades. Things like, uh, oh man, one of my favorites, uh, a great Doctor Strange story. What is it that disturbs you, Stephen? We've talked about that with Pete Craig Russell. One of the really great uh, stories that came from uh, Doctor Strange Annual. Well, that, among a bunch of others, are uh, collected in this wonderful book. 224 pages, and it's 50% off. It's just $14 and 99 cents. Great way to uh, get ready for uh, the movie coming up next weekend. Black Widow, Volume 1, Shields Most Wanted. Uh, that is Mark Wade and Chris Somney, the wonderful team. They're still together, and now they're doing excellent work at with Black Widow. Uh, that collection is 50% off, just $8.99. You can get Star Wars, the epic collection, the original Marvel Years, Volume 1. So uh, that uh, collects uh, the first 23 issues of uh, the Star Wars uh, week monthly comic, plus uh, material from Star Wars Weekly from the UK, and even material from, remember Pizzazz? Maybe not, because you guys are young. I remember Pizzazz. That was a really neat uh, comic magazine that we were able to get uh, through school. Remember, like, like Scholastic Books, ordering Scholastic Books? You get Pizzazz, and we got Star Wars material. Well, all that stuff is collected in this Epic Collection Volume 1, 50% off, $19.00. And 99 cents. You can get Captain America White, our buddies uh, Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale. That tremendous story, uh, zero through issue five, uh, 42% off, $14.49. And even things like the hardcover of Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, excellent. And, of course, Betty Brewweister as well, the uh, the Fade Out Deluxe Edition, 45% off, $27.49 from InStockTrades.com. More great deals. We'll talk about them in the next uh, commercial break, but uh, do yourself a favor and check them out now, InStockTrades.com. Word Balloon is also brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your wonderful support. Uh, you help me get to the shows, make interesting connections, and that usually makes for new, interesting conversations. You help me uh, update my Word Balloon equipment as well and really keep the lights on and keep things running. Thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. 
Word Balloon is free, but if you can help the cause, you can subscribe to Word Balloon via Patreon. If you go to wordballoon.com and click on the Patreon ad, it will take you to my Patreon page. But uh, a few more uh, new uh, subscribers this month. Thank you very much, and thank you for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Without further ado, let us start things off with our conversation with Riley Brown. It's good to have him back, and uh, let's talk to him now about Dash Hudson and Slapstick, two really interesting projects, but a whole lot more as well. Here's Riley Brown on Word Balloon. Riley Brown, welcome back to uh, Word Balloon. It's great to have you back, and uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, the current projects you got going on. Thanks to be back for this uh, for this uh, second a second try at this one, huh? Yeah, I know. We tried to record two days ago. Now we got What we have to realize is now the audience hasn't heard that. So let's let's not fall into well as I was just telling you two days ago. <laughs> so we'll we'll treat it as a new conversation. Um, right. But uh, well, let's start with uh, with what's going on digitally for you. You've been um, doing a, a digital comic for Ghost Tech, the uh, yep. the phone case company, right? That's right. Yeah, they make uh, waterproof cell phone cases, and they just wanted to have some content for their website. And so they got in touch with me to do a weekly web strip for them. Uh, it's called Dash Hudson. And it's just like, it's your, you know, it's kind of a uh, James Bond spoof, super spies behaving badly type of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Kind and, of an Archer thing. Absolutely. Yep, exactly. It's very, very influenced by Archer. <laughs> I watch a lot of Archer, and I love uh, Melissa McCarthy's spy movie. Sure. Um that is brilliant and yeah you know, but it, it's that it's all those tropes and that type of thing and it's just a lot of fun like they let me get away with like anything like i you know i just do whatever i want pretty much and as long as i uh, turn in a strip a week they're happy that's excellent and it's been going on for pretty much all year right yep yeah it's been i think we're up to chapter 42 or something like that that's fantastic, man. The yeah. I, I, I should ask while we're, we mention Archer, have you ever met any of the comic book people that work on Archer? Guys like uh, Kevin Mellon or Neil Holman, the art director for uh, for that show. Um, I, I who I I met somebody out at San Diego. Uh, I don't remember who it was exactly. I, I've met a lot of people that work in animation, you know, here and there. So it's hard to keep track of all of them because they move from one show to the next every season. True. Um, Th- that's true. I know Kevin's been on Archer, though, for a couple of years now, and Neil's been the art director for a few years. He started off as an animator and, and got promoted to art director. And he also worked, I want to say, on uh, C-Lab 2021. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah, good stuff, man. No, those guys are great, and I love how much they look like comic books and everything. So, oh, Totally. I mean, even in Archer, they're always talking about, uh, like, they keep bringing up references to, like, old X-Men stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You know, a few years ago... Um, the Chicago Theater, Archer was on tour, and the cast came and did uh, live readings and stuff. It was very, very funny. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. H. Oh, H. John cool. Benjamin and Aisha Tyler and Parnell was there. I'm trying to think of who nice. wasn't there. I can't remember really right now, but uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing. It was pretty much everybody. It's a brilliant show. It, honestly, it's hard not to rip it off. <laughs> like, I'll sit there, you know, I'll watch it. I probably watch an episode every couple of nights or something like that, just at the end of the day uh and it's so funny and i'm like i I think of things like oh oh i could totally take that line or something wait no (laughs) try to come up with your own stuff riley no i can appreciate that i remember tim (laughs) seeley telling me that like he never saw buffy because he didn't want buffy to influence hack slash right right i mean and you want to i mean i don't mind a little bit of influence like i want to be you know part of uh, like I want to know what's going on, and I want to see like, oh, okay, this type of thing's in style or whatever. Sure. But, um, but you know, it's you you got to keep yourself fresh and make sure that you're not like continuing conversation with uh, you know, another show that other people aren't watching. You want to make sure that all your stuff is um fresh. You know. No, I can appreciate that, and really, and, well, the the real source material obviously is the Bond stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Bond. Well, and also, uh, I've read a lot of um. I mean, yeah, James Bond kind of created all the tropes for, like, spy type of stories. And uh, while I work, I listen to a lot of audiobooks about, you know, like the original James Bond, Ian Fleming audiobooks. And I love those. Um, And I've also, I also listen to a lot of, like, uh, books about, that's actual accounts of actual missions. Like, there was a great one recently, I think it was called... uh, I, I know it was like the the USSR's point of view during the Cold War, 
um, there was like some spy over there that I think passed away recently. He had a friend who was in the CIA, you know, after the Cold War ended, uh, and he'd given him all his memoirs and stuff. And so it's written by a CIA guy telling like his Russian friend's point of view of all this stuff that he'd been through. And it was interesting to hear. There's a couple of times where they were actually like they were actually on opposite sides of the same mission and they didn't realize it till afterwards, obviously. Wow. Um, and I, let me look it up because it's a really interesting. No, book. I, would be, and, I, I would be interested. No, that's terrific. Uh, and it gets right into like, you know, like how, how the things actually operate. And it made, it made a lot of sense to me because there's a lot of stuff in James Bond stuff that I don't quite get like, microfilm and stuff like that i was like well like what is this stuff they're always trying to oh like, that's so get. funny man that you're you know younger and don't understand like I mean, microfilm and the- i knew i knew what it was but i didn't understand why it was such a big deal and like the information that would be on it but then you listen to these accounts and it's really interesting like the like the amount of hoops they have to jump through uh just to get like really basic information sometimes because there was su- such a divide between the country. Like people really just didn't know what was going on. Right. But it's like, but it's yeah. Like they'll, they'll set up these crazy sting operations just to like learn the names of the people working in a certain office so they could try to get a leak in or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then when you can see both the CIA and the KGB's point of view on things, there's so many places where like one side almost like, was so close to figuring something out on the other. I don't know. It's really uh, interesting. What? All right. Let me, I, I got, I got to go through my audible library here. No problem. But, but while you're doing that, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the thing was obviously microfilm could be so small and you could literally like hide microfilm in a box of matches or something like that. So right. you can make such an innocuous kind of drop and, and meet and stuff and then exchange that kind of information. Cause yeah, this was, you know, at a time when the world really wasn't as connected as it is now. I mean, long oh, yeah. distance calls were such a procedure to make happen. And in fact, uh, I even had an uh, an elderly aunt who was a transatlantic telephone operator. And right. she sat in on some pretty amazing calls. I mean, she even sat in on some uh, John F. Kennedy to his mistresses kind of phone calls and stuff like oh, that. Really? And it totally like she was, you know, she worked for the Bell phone company and she took her job incredibly seriously and the whole secret, you know, secrecy thing. And all she said was, I heard some things I probably shouldn't have heard. And I never <laughs> will forgive that man for living the life that he lived. And it really wow. like, I mean, and you know, she was hardcore Irish and she just, yeah, yeah it yeah. was so dis- disillusioned by the realities of JFK and everything. And she's just like, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I don't like him. And it's like, okay. <laughs> My anti lean that 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 would be those would be interesting uh interesting calls to sit in on. No okay, kidding, here's man. The, book. uh, the book's called Spy Master by Tenet H. Uh, Bagley. Wow. And yeah, it's Did, really, really interesting book. If you're interested in cold type stuff. Yeah, no, I love Cold War stuff. I loved also um pre Cold War, the OSS during World War Two. Oh yeah. Yeah, that that's cool too. I mean, I don't know. When you get into like the beginnings of these info- oh <laughs> Sorry, when, man, you get yeah. the, when you get into the beginnings of these spy information networks, it's very interesting. And especially the, you know, like you were saying, just making a a, a long distance phone call back then was such a big deal. Um, but, you you know, so I read this stuff and it come, you get a lot of ideas for stories and, you know, jokes and stuff like that to play. And sure. Know, it's fun. Well, and also I wonder because and, and obviously, too, um, I imagine that, you know, and I know for a fact from reading the, the comic and stuff that uh, – you know, Ghost Tech likely wants their product kind of featured in, in the strip and stuff. But does modern technology make it harder to do spy stories? I mean, you got Jason Bourne and stuff. So, I mean, there are certainly modern examples that show that yeah. in the information age, how a spy story can work and everything. But does it, you know, compare to it like, again, the, the cloak and dagger stuff and the elaborate things they had to get to to pass information seemed like a lot more. Uh, interesting backgrounds and, and uh, story p- possibilities as opposed to as connected as we are today. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's just a lot different from, for my purposes, like, yeah, they want to have their products in there, but it's not, one of the things is they don't want it to seem like a commercial. So it's just about having product placement. Like, like they, they use, uh, as an example, they were using, they said like, make it like when you watch agents of shield, they, um, all the, like all the agents have the same kind of phone that mm-hmm. they're 
you know, that they're and they drive the same kind of car because those are their sponsors, but they never actually talk about the phone. So they, sure. they don't want it to seem like a commercial. Yeah. So it's all kind of like, <laughs> you know. And so, I, so I, in, in the story's DNA, Dash Hudson is a super spy who has a social media addiction. So he's constantly <laughs> Snapchatting himself and uh, putting up selfies and texting uh, or Twittering his adventures. And so he has followers based on his top secret missions and stuff. And that bites him in the butt, but also is part of what uh, – yeah, I mean, it's just another aspect. It's kind of – I mean, in a way, it's kind of like – I guess I'm sort of teary- – treating it like if they're two teenagers spying on each other but i'm just <laughs> putting them in a you know if the teenagers were actually adults and you know uh in charge of the world so they're just like they're on each other's uh snapchat accounts i'm like oh look what this person's up to now <laughs> and that's all a big part of it and so it's a lot of fun and your big bad is uh is an octopus crime boss <laughs> that's right eight gloves marlo the uh ex heavyweight champion um and yeah he i He's from some undersea country that's trying to, you know, smuggle weapons into the United States to take over the world somehow. And <laughs> and that's that's a fun part when he uh when the octopus gets into a boxing match with Dash Hudson because, you know, he's an octopus. He's got eight gloves to you know punch with. So. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's uh, <laughs> the the action <laughs> scenes are great. Uh no, the character design is fantastic and um also I love too that again um, your story progression from a digital standpoint and the way you kind of build uh, uh, layer upon layer to to build a, uh, a a comic panel in an untraditional way that we do see, you know, in your infinite comics as well that you've done, you know, at Marvel and stuff. Um, but tell tell me, because it really impresses me in co- terms of how uh, how quickly you can swipe and and keep the keep the story going. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things that's really important to me is to make sure that – well, it's to take full advantage of whatever medium I'm working in. Like one of the things when I started doing a webcomic that kind of annoyed me – and this is actually going all the way back to working on PowerPlay with Comixology. One of the things that bugged me about so many webcomics out there is they're really just print comics that are slapped up on the internet. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they don't do anything to take advantage of the technology or different – uh, possibilities when it comes to telling a story that you could have with the internet if you wanted to. And so that's why the way I do it, like the panels kind of pop up on top of each other uh, or you change things within the panel to show, to like reveal new information or just to tell a gag or whatever it is. Um, I really try to take advantage of that. Uh, and so, oh, and so one of the things, since it's, you know, web comics have been around for years at this point and so few people do much that's, interesting with them i mean you know format wise not many people do too much that's very interesting and so um i had to develop the web reader for this in order to get it to do what i wanted uh i, I went to my buddy doug hills who's you know a great web comic artist and he's really good at programming and all this and i was like hey man you know web comics this is what i need to do let's develop a reader that would work perfectly for this type of comic and um and it's great. And so the way it's set up is uh, each chapter or each strip is kind of comes up as an individual chapter so that you can click forward and new panels will pop up. Mm-hmm. But when you navigate, you navigate to the beginning of each strip instead of like each individual panel. Otherwise, there'd be like 500 that, you know, you wouldn't get anywhere. Like the navigation menu would be insanely long. Sure. Um, so and then also we make sure it preloads. Uh, all the images like as you're reading them so that you don't have to wait a minute in between uh, clicking Screens. from one panel to the next. Yeah. Yeah. Just it loads really fast and you can kind of, I mean, if you keep clicking forward, you can catch up to the point where it, and it stops loading um, or it, up to the point that it's loaded and the comic stops advancing. But if you just read along at, you know, a regular pace, then you shouldn't. You should be able to just seamlessly go from beginning to end without any slowdown whatsoever. Yeah, it sure felt like that. And I, and I, again, I I really love how you know you'll see uh, dash with a gun and you know swipe and stuff, and then all of a sudden the gun goes off, and it's really the same right. the same image, but now you're getting the the explosion from the gun barrel and everything, and it's it, it looks great. No, I think again, yeah, you, this you're really taking advantage of the way web comics can work and and progress and it reminds me too of the same kind of style that uh Mark Wade and Pete Krause are doing with Thrillbent in terms yep. of in terms of their layers and stuff. Are are you teaching web comics to 
other artists? I mean, I mean I'm sure you're always willing to talk, but you know, do you, do you do that formally or and I don't mean formally in terms of getting paid, but are you are you helping other artists along uh, as far as digital web comics go? Um I well, that well one of the things, well I mean, I don't know. Uh, I've done a couple lectures at colleges about web comics and uh the students always seem really into it cuz it's like it's such a simple, like what I'm doing is so simple <laughs> and it just kind of opens their eyes. Like, Oh man, look at what, what I can do. Sure. With this. If I just, if I just try to think about it a little bit differently and think about it as, Oh, we're reading it on our phones or on the web or something instead mm-hmm. of in a book. What what's schools that I can do? What schools are you going to? Um, well, not, this is not a regular thing, but like I recently did a lecture at VCU, cool. uh, which is where I graduated from college. And a couple of years ago I went, was down at, um, is that Vancouver Scott. or is that uh... Oh, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University? Oh, excuse me. Okay, Virginia Commonwealth yeah. University. And and SCAD, you started to say right. So go ahead yep, and SCAD. And I've uh... SCAD is Savannah, right? Yep, Savannah. And I've talked at Pratt and a couple other cool. places. That's cool. But um, yeah, I always talk about the digital stuff just to you know show people. And yeah, I don't know. People just don't think about it that much. Uh, but then that's also one of the things doing so many infinite comics with Marvel. They love having me. Uh, it, you know, if I can't, if I don't have time to draw the whole comic, to at least do the layouts, because the way I tell the story is so much different than the way most people approach it. Um, that I don't know, other people just don't take advantage of it as much, and so they try to have me at least do the layouts for a comic. So, uh, like earlier this year, I did a did the layouts for um, a Punisher Daredevil story with the Charles Soule wrote. Uh, which actually just comes out in trade today. So if you, <laughs> oh, very cool. Uh, on the nineteenth. So yeah, if you're uh, if you're at the comic store, look for um, Punisher Daredevil uh, Seventh Circle. So you did the layouts. And, who did the finished art? Yeah, at least for the beginning. And then uh, my baby was born, and uh, other things were happening at that time. Sure. So I had to. That that was the one project I had to bail on. Um, so who finished uh, the art for you on that one? Then it went to Mast, who he's he's kind of like the other guy. Like most of the Marvel comics or Marvel Infinite comics, either I do the layouts for or Mast, who's a French guy. Oh wow! Um, and he's a, a French animation dude, uh, and there might be one other guy that does them, but uh, yeah. Um, Very cool. And then and then also I did the layouts for Deadpool Too Soon, that was uh, Todd Nock did the finished artwork. Okay, and that and that is. Uh, that's still going on right now. So I think issue eight just came out. That's excellent. All right. Now, before we, cause I, I know you did the layouts too for, for slapstick, which you co-wrote right. with, uh, with Fred. And we're going to talk right. about that. But before we do, I want to give uh, the URL for dash Hudson, because really, oh, absolutely. you know, you're about three quarters of a way uh, through a very cool graphic novel size story. And if, uh, yeah. you know, and, and people know, listening to word balloon, I'm a nut when it comes to spy stuff, this is great. <laughs> and I really do recommend it. Well, so it's, it's, got, it's yeah, it's go got on. spies and it's got boxing. Those are your two favorite things. This right is there. totally true. Absolutely true. <laughs> and, so, uh, if, you, if you like mermaids and shark men, those are in there too for you. So. There you go. No, ab- absolutely, man. No, honestly, the art is very dynamic. It's a very funny story and uh, totally takes advantage of what you can do with web comics. So, and I don't have the URL in front of me, but I'm going to guess ghosttech.com slash dash. Uh, I think that's it let me, uh, let me let me confirm go you keep talking yeah i mean that's um i yeah i mean that's i, I don't know what to talk about <laughs> <laughs> well, uh yes that's correct that is the correct url i mean uh it's it's a fun i don't know it's a fun story it's just it's it's a chance to get just get to do whatever i want um which is rare and i'm doing the whole thing from beginning to end like i'm writing it drawing it coloring it and lettering it and it's the first time I've ever done absolutely everything to that extent uh, since college, I guess. So uh, it's fun. And who you know, who uh, who do you talk to in terms of uh, helping you out with the writing? Um, I talk to my buddy Kurt Christensen every now and then, uh, uh, and also my friend Scott St. Pierre. Who are, they're both like great writers that I think don't do nearly enough writing, but they're. But because they don't, I can use them as my secret weapons. If I need a good one-liner or something, I'll just say, like, hey, man, I'm stuck on this panel. What do you think of this? And they'll have something brilliant, and then I get to take credit for it. So it's great. <laughs> Outstanding. Uh, let me see here. I'm looking. Uh, is it Ghost Tech Products? Hold on one second. Yeah, ghosttechproducts.com. There we go. That's what it is. So, And also, it's, it's Ghost Tech, uh, only one T, and it's a T-E-K. 
And yeah, I'm looking. Actually, I'm looking at it right now. It's uh, ghosttech.com or ghosttechproducts.com slash dash, and uh, yeah. you know it'll take you right to the story. And uh, it's it's great. Actually, it's funny. It's uh, actually progressing as on my uh, computer at work, and uh, showing uh-huh. me the the art as we're talking. So uh, maybe this is a preview right at ghosttech.com right there on the front page. It is, oh, in fact. Yeah, it it is. It's a. Uh, I mean, this. I mean, it's kind of. They've they've used the comic. It's pretty much that's their brand identity now. They use the artwork from the comic on everything, and I've even done um, some extra artwork for like their products for like the product packaging and stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. Oh wow. Yeah, so like, so. does it have uh, dash? Like, do they have cases that have dash art on it and stuff like that? Uh, I don't think those have come out yet. I think that might be like the next wave or something. Um, I've been doing a lot of them recently. So okay. Um, so it's something that's coming up, but it's kind of cool. It's cool to have that kind of involvement with a company where, you know, it's, I don't know, it's just a fun thing to, uh, to get to do. Yeah. And it's totally free. So it's, it's uh, yeah. ten- tentacles of the Trident dash Hudson in tentacles of the Trident. And it's at ghost tech products.com. And right away, uh, it will uh, give you this kind of teaser with Riley's art. And if you click on that, it'll take you to the story. And it, it's it's really great, so I, I can't recommend it enough. Nice going, man. Thank you. Absolutely. So as you as we started to say, um, you've been uh, doing the breakdowns for the story you're currently doing with uh, with Fred Van Lenty. The first right. uh, digital issue comes out today, correct? Um, yep, that's right. Uh, uh, slapstick. Slapstick. And yep. So it came. So it came out now. So now we can spoil everything because <laughs> because. Uh, Last time we were talking, it hadn't come out yet. So now it's like, okay, we could uh, um, dig into the story and absolutely, everything. very but, cool. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm co-writing it and co-drawing it. So I'm co-writing it with Fred. Uh, we we pretty much go to the bar and just drink a few beers and come up with some goofy ideas. Uh, and afterwards, I go <coughs> home and write down whatever you know, try to string the whatever jokes we told into some kind of timeline into some kind of narrative i send it to fred he adds some things moves some things around uh, and then i go into the layouts and um send them over to uh diego uh Olategue, i think is how i say his last name yeah you know i meant to again i i looked it up uh when we spoke last and yeah i think that is the way you said that is that seems yeah. correct so very cool, Diego Alatagwe, and uh, and so you're kind of doing a modified Marvel style, really, with this story. Kind of, it's uh, yeah, I, I yeah, I don't know. It's I've never done any comic quite like this, where I'm doing half the writing and then like half the drawing, but not the finished. I don't know. It's weird, but it sure. works. So. No, that's cool. No, great first issue, absolutely, man. And I'll be honest, yeah, it's fun. I was never. I, I, this is my blind spot. With uh, certain Marvel characters and stuff, so I really wasn't aware of slapstick, but uh, which is good. Of, I think a lot of people have a blind spot when it comes to slapstick. He's only <laughs> been in a few. He's only made so many appearances to this date. Dan Slott used him in the Avengers Initiative stuff. Yep, and that's also, probably where he's most known from. Okay, and I know, and then, yeah, he's kind of appeared in a few events here and there in in a lot of the tie-in books and stuff. But go ahead. Well, yeah, anytime they want to wheel out like the most random Marvel characters. He'll be part of that group, <laughs> but uh, but usually he's just kind of window dressing. He's not you don't really get into his character very much. Um, and Dan did a lot in the Avengers Initiative, and of course, uh, uh, James Fry and Len Kaminsky um, in the original miniseries that introduced him back in 1992. Um, but that and then and then recently Jerry Duggan brought him into uh, the Deadpool books uh, as one of the mercs for money <laughs> and so at some so originally i so okay so i bet a lot of people don't really know who slapstick is he's this ridiculous little clown character that's essentially a looney tunes character in the marvel universe and the gag is when you're a looney tunes character and you're dropping anvils on people uh that's fine when you're a cartoon but in the real world it's freaking monstrous so <laughs> so that, but that's how he fights crime. He's like, you know, blasting people. He, he's like hitting people's teeth out with his mallet. He's uh, dropping anvils on people. He's doing all sorts of terrible stuff. And, um, but and that's his method of fighting crime. And that 
rubs certain some guys like Deadpool love it and he fits right in, but then other guys like Spider Man don't think that's how superheroes should behave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he he really is. I mean, people refer to Deadpool as like kind of the Bugs Bunny of the Marvel universe. But this really is like taking well, a Roger is... Rabbit kind of or Bugs Bunny style right. Looney Tunes character and putting him in the realistic backdrop of a, of a real 616 adventure. And that's yes. I, I love that juxtaposition as well, because it really makes him stand out. And also, yeah. uh, you know, certainly psychologically, even more so than Deadpool's situation. Because he is this weird uh, comic book character, he's kind of lost a lot of his own humanity. Well, yes. And that's that's one of the things that Jerry has really been leaning on is that when he's in his cartoon form, he doesn't have any internal organs, which includes no reproductive organs. So that's <laughs> taken quite a toll on his love life. And uh, and since you know he can't turn back into his human form, that's kind of what our story is about. It's about him trying to find a way to become human again. Uh, it, it's a it's a quest of a boy trying to get his dingus back, and <laughs> um, and all of that entails. So, uh, and he's not a boy; he's really kind of a young man. I mean, he's he's kind right. of like oh, yeah. you, you told me the other night, like post college, basically. Right. He's because uh, the original series, he was a high school student. Uh huh. Um, and so now you know he's been through the Avengers Initiative. So I mean, so it's kind of like he had some military training. I, I don't. It's never been said if he's gone to college. I'm kind of assuming he hasn't. And um, he, you know, he like went to the military instead. But now he's out of that and he's on his own and he's living with his parents and he's trying to make ends meet so he can move out um, and uh, you know get a proper life going. But he's just frustrated with the with the real world and that not everybody is an awesome cartoon like him. Well, and also you, uh, there's some great family scenes as well. So beyond having to deal with, uh, you know, realistic comic book kind of action and stuff like that, even the domestic scenes has this real good kind of sitcom sort of feel of like this very bizarre character surrounded by normal people. Well, absolutely. That I mean, that's always going to be the fun of slapstick. Is he's so wacky, and then to put him in the most mundane situations, like having dinner with your family, uh, and just you know. Uh, mom and dad nagging at you, and you know the uh, so so what, what we've got we've got his mom, his dad, his brother, his brother's wife, and his brother's two kids. That's uh, that's his family, <laughs> and um, so we you know and so and the family comes and goes throughout the series. They they're definitely a fun like grounding point to kind of you know every now and then remind you slapstick is technically just a regular person or you know not a regular person but he has like a regular family life he has to deal with all the regular problems that any one of us has to deal with and also in the first issue uh spider-man is there for the obligatory team up to of course kind of and the, you know set him in the in the 616 for first time readers obviously and the obligatory uh uh misidentifying an, a superhero as a villain um, <laughs> and fighting each other because that's what you have to do <laughs> certainly Absolutely, man. No, and like you said, I mean, it is weird because, in you know, again, uh, this was a teenager that got powers, but in this case, it's it's Spider Man who is kind of the straight man and doesn't right. really see the humor in uh, in how a slapstick operates. No, well, because uh, by Spider Man's point of view, slapstick is just a complete psychopath. Like, he, like he at one point says, "Like, what kind of superhero are you?" And slapstick's response is, "Superhero? What are you? Eight? Like." <laughs> From Slapstick's point of view, Spider Man's just an extremely un like like uh not unsuccessful, but uh an extremely like unreliable mercenary. Like, why are you leaving these guys alive when you can just kill them and never have to worry about sure. them again? Yeah, no, it's and, a black and white world for, for Slapstick, and yeah, you know, he's got the power to really eliminate these guys and it's like, yeah, why why are you screwing around with saving lives and stuff <laughs> like that? Right, or not not saving lives, or but preserving like, lives. I guess preserving these bad guys' lives that are tr- actively trying to shoot you, and they've already like killed who knows how many people. Uh, sure, like let, let's not care about them. Life's easier if you just smash your skull open and move on to the next one. Absolutely, no, it's that's and, go on. Oh I, well, so there's a <laughs> uh, a clear philosophical difference between their methodology, <laughs> and also. Um, You've got some interesting uh, bad guys for uh, for slapstick to kind of deal with, right? He uh, as he as the, the this first story arc is about um, these other characters that are based on 
these other cartoon characters keep showing up, and all these bad guy cartoon characters are based on other Saturday morning cartoon genres. <laughs> so in issue one, uh, we meet Broman, the master of the multiverse, who <laughs> is <laughs> who's uh, you know he's a knockoff of He Man or a Hanna Barbera like Thundar the Barbarian type sure. of character. Cool. Um, and they slapstick and him really get into it in issue two, and that's a hilarious fight. That one's a lot of fun. Um, and then we go on from there. Like the you know issue three, we introduce the Tors, which are miniature centaurs that are like a combination of Smurfs and My Little Pony. Uh, and it's you know, and so we're just we're we're just coming up with whatever ridiculous idea we can and figuring out a way to fit it in there. Is it is uh, is this leading to some sort of conspiracy? I mean, do these characters exist in the same way that slapstick does and there's a bigger story behind their existence well that's that's kind of what we are gonna learn is that um the, a lot of them keep talking about the champion who you know I, slapstick just assumes is talking about or well i mean we you know we whoever the champion is slapstick is the one who fights them and um uh and but you know he i I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm saying here. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there is some kind. There's something going on. They all seem to have the same exact powers of as him, or not? If not the same exact powers, a similar yeah, uh, a similar biology, and that they're all made out of electroplasm, and they all are like kind of immortal the way that he is. Right. So yeah, maybe there's a bit, and then obviously if he can find this power source that's powering them all, maybe he can find the way to cure himself as well. Right, exactly. And that's kind of the idea is uh let's find yeah, let's just study these things and, you know, find uh uh find somebody who, you know, track down the right mad scientist who can help him like come to you know, you know, figure out how his powers work and how to reverse his powers or control his powers or whatever he's trying to do. And this is an uh, this is an ongoing, right? Yep. Yeah, wow. I think it's I think it's actually Marvel's first digital ongoing book. If uh I could be wrong about that, but as far as I know, I think there's only been mini series so far, mm -hmm. and so this is going to be the first, uh, the first digital first ongoing book, I should say. That's cool, and I and I also think it's neat that um, Marvel is trying humor more than ever, uh, and and has a lot of different ways of doing it. When you compare this to Squirrel Girl or Howard the Duck, and you know now slapstick yeah. and everything. It, well, yeah, I mean it's really cool because a few years ago, you know they wouldn't even. Have been, looked at you twice if you wanted to do a humor book but now there's so many humor books and they're just not shy about it so um yeah i'm pretty psyched about that that's really uh, cool one, one thing that's different about slapstick is like squirrel girl and you know uh gwenpool and things like that they kind of i mean they're part of the marvel universe but they kind of take place in their own little corner where you know where things you know, you know they're sort of in their own little world sure. Slap, slapstick is definitely part of like the main marvel universe like um like it's definitely like a continuation of the deadpool the uh, mercs for money series and so we have team ups with spider-man and whatever and you know i was emailing with dan slot to make sure the continuity matched up in whatever way it had to match up to make sure that it didn't contradict other spider-man stories that's cool um, wow so it's you know so this is like so it's really part of the regular marvel universe here Will, so therefore, will we see more guest stars and stuff as the story progresses? Um, yeah, yeah. Def well, that, I mean, that's the plan. Uh, we haven't got that far yet, but okay. Um, we we definitely want to. I mean, like working with Deadpool, one of the most fun things is to team him up with other superheroes just oh, to yeah. see how they bounce off each other. And with Slapstick, it's you have the same thing going on. Like his his interaction with Spider Man in issue one were so much fun. I definitely want to get those two back together at some point. Okay. And I feel like at some point, inevitably, he's going to have to uh, square things up with Deadpool again because, as we learn in the first issue, uh, or in the, and in the Mercs for Money series, um, that kind of all ended badly. And uh, and you know, there's so many other oh, man, John, like the ideas, like <laughs> like the, the when me and Fred are talking about these story ideas, like you know, and what characters we want to team up with. Some of these are like I just can't wait to get to uh there's a couple stories in particular that I just can't wait to get to so that's excellent um, are they are are your arcs going to be like uh magazine arcs in terms of being five chapters or six chapters whatever yeah uh, the first arc is going to be six chapters long and um and then we'll see 
you know, what, how, and they'll just be as long as they need to be. And uh, each digital issue is actually the same length as a regular comic book issue. Whereas in the past, I think a lot of the digital stuff were about half the size of a mm-hmm. comic. And then they'd combine two to print them. Right. This is a full-length comic book issue. Okay, because, yeah, you sent me the PDF, and it did feel like a, a normal size story. Um, yep. And, yeah, you know, I, I was wondering, too, um, the the progression, you know, the panel progression and stuff, It's it does still feel different, obviously, than a, than a magazine book. Do you have to re- – or do they have to reformat when it's time to, to make it a magazine? Yes. Uh, I, I was actually just talking to the editors last night about that, about who, who has time to do it. Um, and hopefully I'll get to do it. But uh, if not, you know, maybe Diego would or maybe one of the digital guys over at Marvel will do it. Um, but yeah, like because of the weird nature of the digital stuff, especially when I'm doing it and – uh, they and they really encourage this to just completely f- don't think about print at all when you're working in the digital thing. Just make the best digital comic you can. Sure. And I, to- and I totally embrace that until it gets to the point where it's like, okay, now we have to do a print version. It's like, oh crap, how am I going to fit all these panels together in a way that makes sense? Um, and I don't know. There, there are definitely some places in previous series where I was kind of shooting myself in the foot and had to, you know, jump through some major hoops to make it work as a print version but um it always it always ends up fine it always w- reads just fine so that's cool no it's a learning curve man and i i think back yeah. to when malieve and bendis were doing that first motion comic with spider woman and how yeah. you know i mean the, the, that was you know it wasn't even 10 years ago and i think you guys have come a long way in uh, yeah. in figuring this language out and also trans transposing it to the magazine format and stuff. No, this isn't, yeah. you know, I mean, these are baby steps, man. You guys are, you guys are really, <laughs> you know, you've really honestly, and that's, and that's why I always, I enjoy talking to you because I really think that um, digital and, and paper can work hand in hand, but I also yeah. think that there are great storytelling possibilities and you clearly are thinking that way when you're creating this stuff. Well, so, that, yeah. you know, I, I mean, mean and, uh, it, and it is, you're right. It is all baby steps. Um, and it's, uh, but it's like finally, I feel like things are starting to pick up. I mean, I don't like pe- like digital is getting more recognition now, and people are starting to become more innovative. <clears throat> excuse me, more innovative in how they set up their digital comics. Like uh, my studio mate Dean Haspiel is working for, uh, or not working for, but he he publishes comic uh, through Line Webtoons, and they have a whole different system that um, does some really cool things. Like they'll have some comics have music in them. Some of them have uh, uh, like little bits of like I don't want to say animation, but just like they'll have panels that kind of shake or whatever. I don't know. They do some really cool stuff over there too. Sure, no, and I know Madefire is is working along those lines as well. Um, right. Yeah, and and yeah, I talked to Dean about the Red Hook. That's you know that's his yep. great current digital series. No, it's really interesting, and I, you know, um, uh, Astila is out there right now, and uh, yep. Ibrahim Mustafa just did a great spy series. Uh, for them, called Jaeger, that is oh, that cool. you know is kind of I think mid mid story right now. But uh, no, that I I do I think there's really interesting things that are going on, and some of them are as you said, just you know really adapting panel to panel, uh, and and swiping and everything. But then others are really making serious innovations with what they're doing. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's all in. It's all. It's all just comes down to storytelling. Really, at the end of the day, is what's the best way to tell your story to your audience, and what can you do with with the format. Um, and so as long as it's a cool story, it doesn't matter if it's on paper or on a cell phone or, you know, on a bunch of post-it notes, as long as it's a cool story, it, uh, people are going to enjoy it. Are you, uh, have you been doing any panels at conventions to talk about this and, uh, beyond, you know, beyond talking to art schools and stuff like that? Have you, have you taken that kind of programming to panels? Yeah. I mean, uh, every almost every year since I started working on Power Play, I've done a couple of panels with Comicsology at San Diego or New York Comic Con. Um, and now I, at the New York Comic Con a couple of weeks ago, I uh, I was on the Marvel Digital panel, and that's where we were. We showed a preview of Slapstick there. Oh, that's cool! A well attended panel. Um, yeah, actually, I I was surprised. They like well, it's, I mean, yeah, I'm surprised every time because the first <laughs> time I did it with Comicsology. It was a big room, and there's maybe like five people in the audience. Sure. And every year, I've been watching it, like the audience for these panels grow and grow. And now it's you know practically a packed house. So 
it's pretty cool. Are you getting uh, aspiring artists that are asking like good questions or is it a mix of both the readership and artists that are in the audience? Uh, it depends on the panel. The Marvel panel is more readers and um, the Comixology panel is more creators. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they, they ask some great questions. Uh, um, and the answer is always the same. It just comes down to telling the story however you can and using all the tools available to you to tell the best story that you can. Sure. How did, how did New York go in general for you? I saw you in Artist Alley and man, I love yeah. I love that Artist Alley and I'm very nervous to see what it's going to look like next year because I know that uh, the North Wing of the Javits Center is going to be under construction. They're expanding it, which is a good thing, but that is going to probably screw up uh, the convention next year. Yeah, I don't know. When I heard, like, you're the one who told me that. I didn't even know, but um, like, yeah, like, our, New York Comic Con has the best artist alley of any convention, and it's it has been kind of cool. Like the first year they had it in that like North Wing area, I was kind of nervous. I was like, "Oh man, they're putting us so far away from the rest of the show." <laughs> yeah. But because the show is so insanely crowded, it's actually pretty awesome because a lot of people find their way over there, and it's like the one place where you can breathe a little bit. Absolutely. And even there, it gets just as packed as everywhere else. Um, and the artist alley itself is the size of like a good mid-sized convention, That's like true. Any, you know, at any other convention. So yeah. it's pretty awesome. No, you're right. And it's, um, the other good thing is, I mean, unlike so many other conventions, there's natural light. So yeah. you are getting, you know, you're, you're, you know, and it's just, there is room to breathe because that yeah. main floor at the, I'm going to cough. It's, <laughs> <coughs> still left con crud. <clears throat> Excuse oh, me. Man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, just got to clear. There we go. Um, that main floor at New York Comic Con can really be infuriating because <laughs> you. Can, I mean, you know, I try to take photographs and I, you know, really like look at stuff. There's no time because literally there's ten people right behind you that need to get you know to where they're going and stuff. So yeah, it's ridiculous. And and also down by the panel rooms as well, it can really get annoying and frustrating. And oh, artist alley, well, you know, again is is really just. It's a little more open, and there's room to talk, move, and right. you can stand I, I still have, and not feel bad about it. You know, I always have to give myself a half an hour to get from my table in Artist Alley to a panel or sure. a signing out at the Marvel booth or something like that because it takes forever to slowly shuffle through the crowd. Oh yeah, uh, and it's it, like I don't know. I'm not so like I, I'm a guy who I like crowds and I like big conventions. Yeah. I love San Diego so me too. much, but New York Comic Con is the one that can get to me sometimes. So Some, it's. Sometimes those crowds get to be a bit much. And it's just really it's just the the limitations of the facility and also the fact that from going to a pure comic show, they not only added TV and movies, but also the anime stuff and right. and the gaming stuff that they've added. Which, which is all awesome and I love Absolutely. all that. Absolutely. I mean, I think like you said, it's mostly the facility. It, yeah. The Javits Center, there's just so many little bottleneck areas that yes. everybody has to go through the same doorway that, and there's no way around it that just kind of creates these huge crowds that you just can't – there's no way around them. No, you can't and, avoid it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. No, and in fact, it was so funny that you know going from Artist Alley to D.C., D.C. literally – was on the very opposite end, as far south as you could go in the center, compared to where Artist Alley was. And oh. I was cracking up uh, with the DC creators that were going from Artist Alley to do you know, a signing at the DC area and stuff. And uh -huh. it's like, oh my God, because there's the main floor, and then way south of the main yeah. floor, that's where DC was tucked in a corner. Wait. Okay, I don't even – I don't think I went by the DC booth. I went to the Marvel booth, mm -hmm. and usually Marvel and DC are just next to each other. But, yeah, they weren't next to DC. So no. DC was in, like, that, that second room because it's kind of like the main floor is, like, kind of like two rooms there. No, it wasn't even – it was uh, outside of that main floor both room area, and oh, really? it was it was kind of in a corner out by where people are walking and stuff. And you just get past okay. that food concession area that's kind of on the third floor. Sure. You go past that on the main uh, on the main uh, walkway as you enter the Javits Center and go as far, uh, again, as far south as you can. And tucked in a corner, they had this little Wonder Woman kind of display and some movie costumes and a few other things and, uh, an, oh. area, and an area for signings and stuff like that. But, yeah, that's where DC was. It's very oh, yeah, weird. They so, did that last year, so too. I, I, want, I wonder if it's like a price thing, if they're like kind of counting their pennies and they're like, you know what, why, you know. Well, I do like, know, I do know a couple of years ago when there were, tr when there was trouble with uh, badges, 
Um, yeah. A lot of a lot of people were getting into the con, and really they had some trouble with some homeless people that were just hanging out in the D.C. area on the main floor, <laughs> and, and and even a fist fight broke out on on the Wait, main floor. When was I did not hear about well, when you, was you're this? You're tucked away in you're tucked away in Artist Alley. Yeah, Seriously, yeah, right? I, it, it was <laughs> it was like. Back in 2013, I remember Usually specifically. Usually, I'll hear about the fist fights. That, that's crazy. It was nuts, and uh, and you know, DC kind of complained and said to Reed, "Hey, we need more security." And Reed's like, "Hey, we've we've only got so many volunteers. We're we're kind of screwed. We don't right. we can't do that." So yeah. I think it really was this kind of combination of, "All right, well then we want off of the main floor, and we want a huh. smaller area that's our own that we could kind of you know take yeah. care of I and mean, police and everything." So that was, I think, the compromise. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, you're making all your big announcements at the panels and stuff. So right. it does. So, you know, maybe you don't need the 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 booth. Although, I mean, Marvel always does such cool things with their booth. I don't sure. know. Sure. No. And, um, you know, and, and certainly DC, DC has an awesome booth. Yeah, yeah they, I was going to say DC. It's cool movie props. Right. In San Diego. No, they got the, they got all the bells and whistles. I know that that stuff is really expensive, too. And Marvel has always benefited in, in having a partner in terms of defraying right. costs and stuff like that. Whereas I know. Warner's <laughs> kind of done their own thing. I don't know. I'm shrugging right now. I, I just know that, you know, talking to some of the behind the scenes guys, those were some of the frustrations and the solutions to those frustrations. So pretty crazy well, stuff. I'm going to cough yep. again. <laughs> <coughs> oh, my goodness. Man. Anyway, I know. Anyway, that con, that con will get to you, man. Killing me, man. Totally killing me. But uh, hey, you're doing great, and uh, and I'm I'm really glad, and I'm it was good to see you. And also, I know you had kind of a rough beginning of the year. Um, didn't you like, yeah. did you guys, did we, did you have a fire or something like that? What happened? Right. We, well, so, uh, it started off awesome. We, <laughs> hey, you had, had a baby. A, yeah. I had a baby born, uh, on, uh, the beginning of February. And, um, then later on that week, uh, okay. So, then, wow. the, so the baby was born. Then, uh, the next day, I think the Deadpool movie premiered. And then later on that week, uh, was, um, uh, uh, the house next to us caught on fire and the house next to that caught on fire. Wow. And then ours was like, well, I don't know. So it was a huge fire in Hoboken. Our house was mainly okay. There was a whole lot of smoke damage though. Sure. And so we had to move, like we had to throw out like any, you know, when you have a newborn baby, you don't want to mess around with that stuff. Absolutely. No, and, smoke damage can be very absorbent and very frustrating right. because on the surface you think, well, it's not that bad. And then it's like living inside of a, a cigarette or whatever. It's, it's horrible. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it – it smelled like, you know, it smelled like you were in a campfire the whole time. Sure. And um, so we had to – we were able to save most of our stuff that was – like anything that's made out of wood or metal, you can just scrub that down. But anything like all our clothes, we had to get rid of anything yeah. that was like couches or soft, anything soft that could absorb uh, particles. Um, we had to get rid of wow. and and all all the baby stuff. We got rid of all the which oh. is the saddest thing. Yes, that's the saddest part because everyone just bought us all these uh, like most adorable oh. little baby clothes and stuffed animals and stuff. And to just see, you know, it's like sorry, like we can't have this around. You know, like sorry, Cookie Monster, you've got to go in the garbage. Oh. And yeah, it was uh, it was pretty terrible. But um, and then we were pretty much just couch surfing for uh, for a few weeks, which is not what you want to be doing when With you a have baby, a baby. Yeah, new baby. Oh my god, that sucked. But uh, and so you know, and my wife Shauna was, um, you know, she was just learning to be a mom, feeding the kid, and taking care of him, and dealing with this crazy sleep schedule that you have anytime you have a newborn. And then I. You know, and so for a while I was the only one working, and she's wow. she's on maternity leave and stuff. So sure. I had to work. At, uh, I did a bunch of covers for Marvel. Um, at the, I mean, luckily I would kind of I would planned to not be working as hard as usual, so like I didn't have any major major deadlines. But I had, you know, so but I, I did have to do something uh, because all of a sudden we had all these expenses and stuff. Um, and so I was trying to get some work done. Uh, and but then also you know I uh, had to go like find a new house, clean up the old apartment, get out whatever we could, uh, and it was very it was very stressful times. <laughs> um, but it's weird when you're in a situation like that, like you you know you kind of reach a point where it doesn't feel as stressful because there's no decisions to be made. It's just 
or every decision has to be made immediately. So you're not stressing out over, oh, what's the right move? It's just like, okay, got to go find a new apartment. Well, I'm going out today. And by the end of the day, we're going to, I'll make a choice. Like that's all there is to it. Um, and yeah, you just kind of fly like, and, and then you don't realize how stressful it was till it's all done. You've moved into the new place and you sit down on your new couch and you just relax and you're like, Oh my God, <laughs> I didn't realize how unrelaxed I was. Well, I'm glad that, uh, you know, you're past that now and everything's normal yeah. and you got a new house uh, and everything and everything's great now. New house, um, just a few blocks from the old one. Cool. Uh, and yeah, and so everything's going smoothly now. Excellent, man. Well, again, I know you're you know you're doing great work, and uh, and I'm glad. And uh, this is really exciting for you to uh, be co-writing and 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 doing this with yeah. slapstick and everything. So uh, first issue is out digitally. Um, yep. Check that out. And, and it, is it on a monthly schedule then? Yep, it'll be coming out every month. Okay, very cool. So the October issue is out. Look forward to the no- November issue. And uh, very easy to catch up on uh, on uh, digitally, either through Comixology or Marvel.com, however you get your digital comics. Uh, right. And then also, uh, you know, Dash Hudson uh, is is waiting for you at, at ghosttechproducts.com slash Dash if you want to get directly to the story. Yeah. Or really, if you go to ghosttechproducts.com, uh, it'll be on the front page, and you can just click through that way. And it's Ghost Tech, one word, and it's uh, T-E-K Tech. So yeah. and only one T in that uh, ghost tech, <laughs> but uh, well, you know you got to get all the particulars out so they know where to right. find it. But That's really right. fun stuff, man. And uh, keep it up. Thank you. I'm 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 glad things are uh, normalizing again, schedule wise, and you know yeah. life life is uh, normalizing. So uh, no, keep up the good work, and uh, always good to check in with you. And uh, when there's yeah. something new to talk about, please come back. Absolutely, you know I will. Next up, really excited to have Ryan Dunleavy on the show. Uh, Ryan and Fred Van Lente have usually been on together because uh, I really got knocked out by uh, their project, Comic Book Comics, or the Comic Book History of Comics. Those are the couple names that it's been described on. Of course, Action Philosophers even preceded that. Um, These are uh, great from an informational standpoint and also just great entertainment. And uh, they knocked me out because it shows you what comic books can do beyond, you know, just a, a pure entertainment story. Especially in the case of the comic book history of comics. Uh, action presidents can be the same, you know, described in the same way in action philosophers. But really, um, I'm so excited that IDW is bringing this series back. The, the cough on offering, uh, ordering that first issue is on Monday, Halloween. So uh, if you can, get to your comic book story. If you haven't already or- ordered the first issue, this is going to be a great 12 issues. And um, just tremendous content. They're adding new uh, content to it in addition to that. The series is now being colored, and uh, Ryan talks about that. But we also talk about a lot of other interesting projects that Ryan has going on, a couple web comics, uh, a, a cookbook that uh, Ryan illustrated uh, back in the day, a vegan cookbook. Uh, very interesting stuff. And uh, much like Riley, I think, another guy that is interesting to hear how he markets himself and uh, has found some interesting projects uh, unlike, you know, the normal straight-up comic book gigs that uh, one would get. So it's a real pleasure to have Ryan Dunleavy on now uh, to talk about things. And we, we really start in mid-conversation here because we just get the ball rolling. So here's Ryan Dunleavy on Word Balloon. So how you been, man? Very good. How was, how was the trip back? How was New York Comic-Con for you? Uh, New York was okay. I got, I got massive con crud. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. I I always I always manage to like not get it. I think it's because I'm around small children all the time. Like, <laughs> so you've built their, up a... their diseases are much worse than like what yeah really what, what the average nerd, nerd is carrying exactly exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, man. Yeah, I'm not I'm not much of a shut in. That's probably what it is. So. I, well, that's <laughs> good too. Very good. I uh, you know being I, around a bunch of people, it works. I, I it works. you know I work downtown in downtown Chicago, so I mean you know I'm on the train and you know I'm surrounded oh, by yeah. people and stuff. But yeah, I don't know I. Uh, I was good until it, it really it, it kicked in the Tuesday after Comic Con because I always build in because now being older I, I always yeah. kind of always like oh yeah, yeah build in two days <laughs> of like you know re- you know recovery days post yeah I still I, I'm still even though I don't get sick I, almost never it's like I, the day after a con uh, I just yeah I, I know yeah. I'm not gonna get anything done yeah exactly <laughs> so yeah I was like all right I'm doing all right everything's fine and then like mid Tuesday <laughs> afternoon I'm like uh oh and sure yeah. enough I'm like oh son of a <laughs> so I felt bad. I had to like ask for an extra day off from work. I'm still coughing for that matter. It's very likely oh, I'll be gosh. coughing during our conversation. But uh well these okay. things happen anyway. So but Ooh. uh you know, I know you were in the uh in the power uh aisle right there. It was you, it was Fred, and it was Greg. 
yeah, they always put the three of us together. That's fine. Uh, which is, yeah, which is fine, you know? <laughs> well, and I know, you know, I want to say I heard either Fred being interviewed or somebody on a, on a podcast talking about Fred. And it's like, sometimes I want to say Greg Van Lenthe because they always write so many <laughs> things together. So they really, you know, the thing is, they really haven't. I They've know. done, they did Hercules <laughs> and they did a book on how to make comics. That's true. And, I I know they've got it. They must have done other stuff, like maybe some Hulk one shots or something here and there. But they really haven't done much more. I guess it's because both of them got so well known from working together that one time on the on the maybe everybody, book, yeah, yeah, and it was so popular. Exactly, and yeah, and like you said, no, they kind of did uh, like alternate a little bit uh, with uh, with Hulk and everything. But you know, uh, you can mm-hmm. say the same thing kind of about Christos Gage and, and Dan Slott because they're always constantly. Oh sure, yeah, to, and they, and I know people don't make that distinction, so it's it's kind uh-huh. of unfair. <laughs> yeah, and I people are shocked. I've actually worked with plenty of other writers, and everybody's like, "Really, you work with people other than Fred?" But I I really do. List off <laughs> some I, of the other list off some of the other writers you've worked with. I've worked with well, right now I'm doing two different web comics with two different writers. Very cool. One of them is this guy named Eric Mahoney, who's a um. It's called the comic we do is called Politiacy, and it's on <laughs> Line Webtoon, and it's about the politics and the election. It comes out every week. I'm actually drawing the next issue right now. Oh, that's great! Man. Talking. Uh, yeah, it comes out on Thursdays. Um, he's an advertising guy. He's not really a um, comic writer. This is like his first thing, but he's really funny. And he's done stuff for um, – for, for, he used to write for The Daily Show and uh, a couple other things. Oh, so. wow. Yeah. Cool. And so you so – and and I do that with it, Eric. Excuse me. It's on Line Webtoons and again, Politius. Line Webtoon called Politiacy. Politiacy. Like idi- Politiacy, yeah. Oh, like idiocy. Okay, I get Like you idiocy, know. but – Political. And yeah, we've had a lot of material to work with lately. So. I would think so. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we did um, the first and third presidential debates. We did. Uh, we actually did a live comic. We were making a comic as the debate was going on and That's posting a, great a, idea. That's a new fantastic. panel. Thanks. No post. It wasn't. It was there. It was his idea. Not mine. Yeah. But I was so. like, oh, but so we were posting like a new panel riffing on like mystery MST 3K style. <laughs> Uh, the um, every five minutes or so with this <laughs> this character, um, you know, who's making his own like sort of a daily show in his basement. That's the whole premise. I see. Him, okay. Yeah. So so I mean, it affords you the opportunity too, though, to you know draw Hillary and Trump. I imagine. Yeah, I'm getting a little tired of drawing Trump. To be honest, he's easy. To, he's easy to draw, but uh, you know, I think we're all tired of him in every. In almost every aspect, but but you so. know what you're best known for in terms of action presidents, philosophers, and the comic book uh-huh. history of comics, which you're going to correct me on whatever the current iteration is going to be. Uh, yeah, for, which is go ahead, tell me. Oh, okay, so yeah, um, IDW is bringing back the comic book history of comics in full color. Okay, um, they've been a big. I mean, they Fred and I uh, self published the original series, which yes. is in black and white comic book and then, comics uh, back in the day, and then. Yeah, exactly. Comic book comics. Tried Googling that. And um, <laughs> the as we were getting ready to wrap up the trade, you know, make a trade paperback, IDW approached us and offered to do it for us. So because they were, there were people there that were big fans of the series, um, Chris Ryle and a couple other people. And uh, so we just took them up on it and it's done really well for them. And it's done so well they want to bring it in, into – they want to make a color version. That's fantastic. So uh, we hired – they hired a great colorist. Um, I'm going to mangle his last name, but he's doing a ter- terrific job. His name's uh, Adam – I think it's Gorinsky. Let me check. It's, it's, it's Polish. Um, but he's coloring the whole thing. And we're also uh, – and we're going to release it as single issues. It's going to be 12 issues this time. Okay. And Fred and I are making new material as well. Um, I'm drawing all new covers for one, but are also doing alternate covers that are going – that's going to be the comic book prehistory of comics. So we go all the way back to cave paintings. We're doing hieroglyphics. And these are like one-page uh, comics about – the history of comics before the yellow kid, which was our starting point of the original series. Sure. Very cool. That's and, great. Um, Go on. Thanks. And then we're also doing, um, we came up with a backup feature called the, uh, the herstory of comics, which is something that we grossly overlooked. And, uh, for lots of reasons is we didn't have a whole lot of women cartoonists in the final series. And so we're trying to correct that by, um, spotlighting a lot of the really influential and more important um, and interesting uh, female cartoonists that have been around since, uh, since the beginning of the medium. We start, the first one we did was, well, I just did one on Tarpe Mills, who is the, um, the cartoonist of uh, Miss Fury. Mm-hmm. The first um, 
I think the first female superhero cre- completely created by a woman. Yep. That's an old Marvel Marvel one. And I uh, Yes, no, I know Karina. I'm blanking on who I did like the first one. Karina Bechko just did a, a good run of uh, Miss Fury uh, Dynamite. Oh, I know yeah. has yeah. been uh, doing right. a lot of uh, stories with Miss Fury lately. Mm-hmm. And then we did another one on Nell Brinkley. Now, um, Nell Brinkley, I don't know. Tell me about Nell Brinkley. Nell Brinkley was coined the king, the queen of comics by um, by Hearst. Uh, she basically created what's known as the Brinkley Girl, which was like this sort of glamorous, um, you know, caricature. Yeah, yeah. No, I have heard of the Brinkley Girl. And I, there's, did, there's I didn't a, realize that uh, you know Nell Brinkley was the was the creator of the Brinkley that's, Girl. That's that's where the all that's where the name came from. That's fantastic. That's her name. Hey, absolutely, man. No, there there have been and and absolutely you know great significant women. Dorothy Woolfolk over at DC yeah. was a longtime romance editor, uh, mm-hmm. going going back from the forties through the seventies. You know, I yep. mean, so so you know, and certainly Marie Severin and. Uh, oh, sure. You know, yeah. So there's there's a lot of very significant women, and that that's we, awesome that you. This is a great yeah, way we, to expand the book, and and you know, correct. I'm putting up air quotes. You know, the the oversight in terms of you know when you guys did your initial history. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems we had is like when we did the initial history, and there's so much about comic book history that's like hard to get it all in. Yep. And we decided early on to focus more so on the movements in the. In the in the artistic medium itself, like oh, you know all the breakthroughs. Yes. Uh, like you know, this is how the comic strips went. You know, went from comic strips to comic books, yep. or you know things like that. And unfortunately, you know, comic books is such a boys' club that when these big movements happened, there weren't a whole lot of women participating in it um, at that level. Yeah, absolutely. At that level, which was you know, which is really unfortunate. A few came through, like with underground comics. Uh, uh, Sherry Flanken, I think that's how you pronounce her name. Who's one of? I should learn how to pronounce her name because she's one of my favorites. Um, was part of the whole Air Pirates crew. Oh, so that's she right. Was, okay. She was featured in there, but like, there's so much history to cover. Like Trina Robinson only got mentioned. I didn't even get to draw her in it. Oh. There were anything that she did in there, but you know, she's actually been a big help with this, um, with that this does, part of the project. Does not surprise me. I know she did a, an amazing book last year about a mm-hmm. lot of significant. Uh, women cartoonists of the World War II era, specifically. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. no, and, she's but, she's amazing, and I and man, I keep meaning really to get her on. And every now and then, when I get close to having her on, I hear, oh, she's not feeling well, and I'm like, all right, then I won't. You know, I'll leave her oh, on for man. a little while and stuff. <laughs> you got to get her on. <laughs> As I start oh, coughing. <laughs> Excuse me. See, this is what I'm talking about. I still got residue concrete, but no, I you know, uh, it's another reason to get her back. And no, she's doing great. It's just you know, typical kind of. Hey, she's yeah. not feeling well. She's got, you know, she had to cancel. She came to Chicago or was going to come to Chicago. And I know she, uh, I want to say she canceled her cake appearance because mm-hmm. uh, she had a flu and everything. I mean, no, these things happen. It's all yeah, right. it does. She's doing fine. She's doing good. Yeah, you, you should get her on. I mean, I would there, there, there would be a huge, you know, you'd, you'd, I'm sure you'd talk all day with her about oh, stuff. She, she's great. amazing. No, I know. And I mean, mm-hmm. that's the thing. We've had very nice conversations in you know convention lobbies and and you know various moments and stuff or after panels yeah. and stuff and no she's amazing and and such a smart woman and it would be a pleasure to uh, mm-hmm. to eventually and I will we'll we'll get her on yeah so. <laughs> yeah but yeah like we as I was uh, saying like Fred especially has been diving into the the history of comics to find more material and there's just there's just so much out there sure and it's like this could be a whole another book in a, of itself unfortunately we're only going to do about you know we're we're only allowed to do well only have the space to do about two or three pages an issue okay. but yeah it's new stuff that's coming out and it's all in full color and it looks fantastic well it's, and uh, also the original run was like what eight issues i think it was six issues but oh, they were wow. all double they were all double size okay so now they're sort of broken up and um we're also this is what we always do is like we finish this big project and then we realize all the mistakes we made like <laughs> like with action philosophers we did it all out of order and you know because we were like oh it's only going to be three issues and then all of a sudden it was nine like oh now what do we do um, and the same thing happened with the comic book history of comics. We had to rearrange it into chronological order. And um, we we had done some other extra stories for other publications that fit into it. And, you know, just basically trying to Frankenstein it all together into a graphic novel at the end. Have you guys finished Action Presidents yet? or uh... We are at the halfway point right now. Okay. of our, our con- you... We were contracted for four books with the possibility of doing more. And we have finished two. Okay, and you're taking a break, George, obviously, for this uh, comic book history of comics. Absolutely paper? not, absolutely oh, not. This is me. going on at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm only, do, yeah, I'm doing. 
So I'm drawing two web comics, doing new material for comic book history of comics, and still drawing the graphic novels for uh, Harper Collins. I That's stay busy. Excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> All right, now tell us about the other uh, web comic that uh, you're doing. Oh, the other web comic I've been doing it for three years. It's called uh, Tiny Dick Adventures, which is <laughs> and it's just as horrible as it sounds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan Somer, who is a, writes two web comics, he writes uh, one called Looking for Group and uh, another one, what is it called? Least I Could Do. And he has other various artists working on him. This is a spinoff of, of Looking for Group, which is a fantasy comedy, long running comedy uh, web comic um, about like a Dungeons and Dragons or Warcraft type setting. And uh, he was only getting out for a week um, for episodes a week and he wanted to do this spinoff. So he did, he, he hired me to do this, to be the artist of this weekly, um, gag, like newspaper style gag comic featuring their breakout character, which is Richard the Warlock. And we also, <laughs> AKA Dick, but we draw him as a little kid. So it's tiny Dick adventures. And, uh, yeah, I've done it for three years now every week and, uh, they're pretty fun. Awesome. Very cool. Now, now that you're just putting up on your own, or is that... Uh, no, that's at uh, lookingforgroup.com. Oh, excuse and me, it comes of course. Out on, comes out on Wednesdays. Very cool. Uh, and that, they, it runs alongside their main storyline. That's excellent. And again, is it uh, for uh, for your for your first webcomic that you mentioned, and I can't remember mm -hmm. the name of it, Politiosity? Politiosity, yeah. Um, it, and and it get, is that through Line Webtoon, you said? That's through Line Webtoon, yeah. Excellent. How's uh, that going? That's going great. I mean, we've gotten a really good audience, a really big audience really early on. We have a lot of people that love it. We have a lot of people that hate it. Um, so, you know, the attention is great. <laughs> That's good. And I mean, yeah, um, just working with those uh, those people, because there's I know several creators that are uh, doing web comics for them right now. They're fantastic. They're incredibly supportive. Um, and they're reaching an audience that just, you know, a, like a brand new audience with all new material. And I've met a lot of the other creators at, at New York Comic Con for the first time. It was actually the first time I had met Eric face to face. And um, there is a great I'm really happy to be part of the group. Everybody's very enthusiastic about comics. And it's really interesting to see it, you know, in this whole another. I mean, we're you and I are used to like, you know. The, the old school print comics and or, or maybe you know digital distribution, but to see it like all these comics that are made specifically for mobile devices, and it works, and it's it's really exciting. It's really fun to be a part of it. Were they set up at the front of uh, Artist Alley? Where they had they were with all the big green banners yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I saw I saw Dean Haspiel uh, sitting there, and actually I know uh, mm -hmm. they were even kind of looking over submissions. Uh, you know, people were they are. up and. You know, and it was great. And I was watching like Dean kind of in a very constructive way pick apart somebody and go, okay, you got to do this, uh -huh. this, and this. And yeah, you know, good guy. He kind of knows his stuff. Were you up there also? Yeah. Uh, kind of, I was, I was. I did do a signing. I wasn't doing a, a yeah, it's, uh, Dean and Tom Abel, who's the main uh, editor, I guess, were doing portfolio reviews cool. at some point. But I did a signing. Eric and I did a signing along with a couple other cartoonists. And one of them, his name's uh, Shen, is incredibly popular and uh he had a big line going with it, which they shuffled in front of the rest of us and we just sort of awkwardly signed their stuff even though we knew we were, they weren't there for us. <laughs> no they, it was a few it was, people were it was very active i mean honestly yeah uh, it didn't matter what time of day and i mean it was 10 hour days in artist alley as we know uh yeah uh, <laughs> this year at new york and uh no it was always very busy over there so that was kind of cool mm -hmm. to see yeah this is the first year that i stayed like till they always say it stays open till eight it's oh. the first year I know that I stayed till then oh. and people came by and it was actually a nice way to wind it down. Um, I didn't have to run home. My family was off on a scout camping trip. And so I didn't have to run home like right, right at six o'clock. Very order to... nice. Excellent. <laughs> what, what level of Cub Scouts are the boys in? Um, it's actually they're in the, girls? it's not Cub Scouts or Girl Scouts. It's a co-ed group called the Baden Powell um, International. Oh God, what is it? The BPSA, Baden Powell Scouting Association. Oh, it's basically nice. the same as like the Girl Guides or what they have in uh, England and stuff. But it's like a co-ed, all-inclusive uh, group, nice. and it sort of pushes away all that the stigma of like you know, boys the, group, girls anti inclusiveness group. of the other ones. Yeah, and they do basically <laughs> back to basics outdoor scouting. It's fun. That's really um, nice. My son's been in it for five years. He loves it. That's really cool. That's excellent, man. Very very nice. Hey, I am I am thrilled. That uh, the comic book history of comics is coming back now. What what is the title again? It's uh, the comic book history. Well, we titled it the Four Color Comic Book History of Comics. Ah. That's what's going to be on the on the stands to the, uh, distinguish it. They did something similar with uh, when they they uh, reprinted the Ninja Turtles in color. It's oh. called like Ninja Turtle Color Classics. Gotcha, or something like that. Okay. So they wanted they wanted something to set it off 
oh, sure. from that. But no, yeah, I understand that. it's it's mostly that you know I've we've done corrections, we've done to the old stuff, but mostly that it's in color and it really looks fantastic. And at first, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be a fun little thing. That's nice that they're reprinting it, but now I'm like really excited <laughs> that it's coming out because it looks it looks so good. You were selling prints of were they the prints of the alternate covers or, or uh, other material? Because I, I remember at your table you had like uh, like a full page. That you... I had a yeah I did a um, there was a spread from of uh, Jack Kirby basically inventing his style and I had I had colored that some time back it was a it was a promotional item for um, Fred's Fred and Crystal Skillman's uh, King Kirby play sure and I so I also had some prints left over and I I was selling them at the show but that particular page that you saw Adam completely recolored it oh, and wow. it looks. It looks even better. It looks way better than what I did. Okay, because yeah, that was I was pretty impressed with that, man. No, absolutely. And I'm kicking myself because I'm like, oh, I got to buy that. And then, of course, the show ended. I'm like, son of a. Well, Damn. you might be in luck because we're sending those out as promotional items uh, to stores pretty soon. It's they're at the printer right now. Oh, excellent. So uh, you'll probably see one, and if you're friendly with the comic book store, maybe they'll maybe they'll hook you up with one. That sounds great, man. <laughs> Fantastic. I appreciate it. I uh, I'm gonna have to uh, yeah bug my uh, bug my stores to uh, m- maybe get me one of those. Uh, or maybe some creators that I know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Although you don't have extras, it's all right. <laughs> oh, I have. No, I have some. All awesome. right. Well, we'll see. That's I all right. I, man. I might have. I don't know. Nope. I know I gave out a few, quite a few. No, yeah, it's I okay. Knew, I give me one, one, but it's okay. It's all right. I'm... <laughs> you guys do plenty. We're talking about, on. man. I have a fine sketch card of you that you gave me of uh, of oh, Kirby, really? very a very disgruntled Jack Kirby. Yeah, when the when the first run was coming out. Absolutely, man. Well, that's what I was going to say about your, uh, your the political uh, web comic that you're doing. Um, I like your style and, and, and when you do real people uh, beyond, beyond your cartoon people as well because you do have this great knack of you know, bringing out the essence of the person in your cartoony oh. style. So that's, that's very that's very kind of you to say because I I actually I I hate the way I draw real people really and I always feel like oh yeah it's just I never feel like it, it quite gets a likeness. In fact, I've struggled so much drawing Hillary Clinton. And over the last, you know, with this, this comic strip and every time I draw it, I feel, I look at it, I'm like, this is completely different than how I drew it before. In what way? Um, but it's think, kind of you to say that. Yeah, I, well, well I, tell me because, I mean, I think about her face and she's got that kind of high cheek, chip, chipmunk cheek kind of face. And she's yeah, got those big yeah. bulging eyes and everything. And I don't, hey, I'm, I, by the way, I'm voting for her. So I'm not saying this in any, <laughs> you know, beyond the fact that I'm, I'm picking on her from a facial standpoint. Yeah. Believe me, she could rip me apart, apart if she, <laughs> if she were to see me. So it, it's okay. Yeah. But yeah, I would yeah. think that you know, and she's got that kind of you know old lady hair and everything that that yeah. you know kind of so- it short does change. Sassy. You know, every time I look up at a, another, another her ch- hair keeps changing, and every time I look up a new photo, I'm like, no, that's not how I drew it the last time. That's hilarious. <laughs> but uh, you know, don't have that problem with her opponent. He's he's a cinch. Man, I'm gonna to have draw. to I'm gonna have to go to the website and and and, and find some good images of uh, Trump and Hillary from you. Okay, uh, you know, yeah, man, because well, I uh, no, I. <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like you, to see use them for good or for evil. You know, it's, that's what well, it's there for. Just to promote, just to promote our conversation. That's fine, man. I, <laughs> I uh, no, I, I think that's neat. And uh, well, you're kind of answering my question then, because I was wondering, um, given what you do, would you ever and had you ever thought about maybe doing like political cartooning or anything like that? Not really. I'm not really. Um, that's not the cut. I, I'm. No, I never really. <laughs> this was just something that came out of the blue. It's. I'm trying to think of like give an eloquent w- reason why I wouldn't, why I'd never considered it before, but I can't think of one. You're just not politically uh, I minded considered or, it, you know. I, I, yeah, for the most part, I'm, I'm not very politically minded to be All honest. Right. Right. Um, I am, I'm aware of it. I just don't, I find it, I can't believe I'm doing it because I actually find it pretty obnoxious when people, you know, I've had many, many uncomfortable Thanksgivings at home. Oh, sure. Uh, with the relatives and you know i just i mean uh, i was traumatized by it uh, from an early age hearing you know people in oh, my own funny. saying horrible things about that just weren't true and i'm just like you know you just can't convince people when they're when they're so passionate about it about these things it's almost impossible to have a civil conversation about it even with people that you agree with or, you, you know, know that, and i i appreciate that point of view i guess i grew up because i grew up in a very uh, debating family. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm one of the older people, uh, yeah. you know, at the table and stuff, I get really like, uh, shut down by, yeah. by some of the younger adults. And I'm always like, 
hey, relax. Guess what? Yeah. We, we were doing this when you were a toddler, yeah. and we don't hate each other. We just disagree. Mm-hmm. And also, I find it interesting because it's like, well, what do you think? And and not with any yeah. got you in mind, but just like, I'm just trying to understand why you feel opposite the way I feel. And it's, yeah. I mean, really, it's funny because I, I have a, I have an older cousin who's about, he's in his mid sixties. He's about like 15 years older than me. And he and I, like I said, I mean, we grew up with our fathers kind of like having these, these argue, not even arguments, just discussions. And mm-hmm. we're, we're loud Greek people. So we're, we're always yeah. talking loud anyway, but they're like, do you have to do that at the table? And it's like, <laughs> Jesus, relax. It's, yeah. I mean, and, and it's funny because even he and I are like, Man, I really want to talk to you about this, but I don't want to get yelled at. <laughs> yeah. So we have to find a quiet corner and duck away. Uh-huh. And it's like, all right, let's talk about this. All right, now yeah. what's going on? And it's it cracks me up. See, I don't, I don't have the, we don't have the trauma that uh, that's, yeah. and I do get it because I can appreciate. And again, it is sad because really every every season it gets nastier. And I mean, God, oh, yeah. you know, you thought you thought two thousand eight and twenty twelve were. Tough years and stuff. Oh my God, 2008 seems like a dream. No kidding. <laughs> even 12. You know, and, yeah. and really yeah. just the extremes of, of Romney and Obama seemed uh-huh. like kind of off putting and everything. And the, yeah, this is, that was a folk dance compared to what we're doing right now. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. My God. So well, believe me, I know. And as we're counting off yeah. the days, just uh, just under two weeks, man, then, it, then it'll uh, I know. I know. hopefully calm down. Hopefully. Yeah. I, I like, I mean, I, I like to listen and hear other people's opinions, even when I disagree with them. But, you know, I don't like getting getting the reverse of that when, sure. when I start talking. And so yeah, that's why I mostly stayed out of it. Do you it's think like, oh, OK, come on. You know, I can give you I can I can give you um, an ear, but you can't give what to me. It's just, you know, it's, I hate that. It's tough post-election. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Sunday television uh, watcher as well for all the Sunday morning news shows. And, yeah. you know, those guys going back and forth. And after the election, I mean, I know that, it, you know, I mean, you'll get a little bit of that honeymoon into the transition and everything with yeah. the new president. And then things really do kind of like, all right, well, that's the president. Let's move on. Uh, yeah. Whatever. And so do you get uh, like, are you guys planning on continuing? Yes. It's def- stuff? Oh, yeah, it's definitely going to continue. Okay. It's just, you know, this is just the timing of this is just uh, this is when um, sure. when the timing is right to do right, right to start this. You- um, we actually wanted to start back in April, okay. but it was a little it was a little too crazy for my schedule, and uh, sure. we didn't start until July. I think actually we started on July fourth. I think that was when the first one happened. Do you think you guys might collect what you did and then put out a book? Oh yeah, for sure. I'm doing um. I'm when I'm drawing them, I've got it with a nine panel grid in mind. Okay, so, very cool. Yeah. So uh, yeah, th- and that's always I, repurposing things to, for new things is always. Uh, is I've always, I always have that in mind. Like even when I, back when I was doing action philosophers and we were just doing shorts, I'm like, Hmm, how can I turn this into a mini comic? How can I, you know, how can I turn it into a single issue? Um, and that's how, I guess, you know, my tenacity of like, don't let this, let this stuff disappear after you finish it. Just, sure. you know, kind of made things happen. How tough is that in terms of once it's out and then repurposing? I mean, what, what do you have to do to, you know, I mean, like it, fitting fitting that all into reformatting or whatever. Just a lot of desk, just a lot of desktop publishing. Once okay. in a while, you have to redraw stuff. Not very often. Okay. Uh, the only time it ever really bothered me was actually in Action Philosophers that that the Plato story that we did, which was I think was the second one that we I ever that Fred and I ever did, uh-huh. and we did it in this weird oversized tabloid format. Because a magazine that was in that size had approached us to do it. I see. And I had to reformat it to comic book size. And the panels didn't really work. And some of them were oversized. Um, but when we did the hardcover collection two years ago, I completely redrew it. I don't know if anybody noticed, oh, but I did. Oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. I basically took the layouts and, and inked them. Because um, when they were uh, – the original way, like some of these panels were about – on the page, originally they were drawn like three by – you know, three inches wide, but then they were blown up to full size. And it looked, to me, it looked really weird and it bothered me and we kept reprinting it. And then finally we did this hardcover. I'm like, I got it. I kept saying, I'm going to re-ink it. So it all looks consistent throughout. And finally, when we got the dark horse, wanted to do the hardcover, I'm like, it's now or never. And I did it. That's cool. I've always been impressed, uh, right? Because uh, beyond that, you you know, some of the other collaborations you've done and I was like pointing it out that cookbook you did a couple years ago. Was it a vegetarian cookbook? Yes, Dirt Candy. That was yes. the, another another couple of great writers that I've worked with. I keep forgetting. Yeah, Amanda Cohen and Grady Hendrix. Um, you know, co-wrote that, and I drew it. And you know, yeah, that was a good time. 
I always I wish we could do more, but uh, Amanda's super bit super busy. Understood. So, did yeah. that do well? Did it did did it? Uh, it's done know? very well. I I've heard it's in its sixth printing. Fantastic! Um, wow. Yeah. So and it still goes. I still see it in, on bookshelves all the time. I think it's doing well. Um, but yeah, we just haven't had time to revisit it. That's a um, shame. You know? Do you now? Do people come to you? How did how did you know a gig like that happen? Well, that happened. Um, that was kind of funny because, well, Grady and Amanda, who are the writers on the book, are married, and uh, Grady's a great writer. We've done another. We did another little side project uh, where we had, did an adaptation of Little Women, um, which was as like gag comic strips, and we're trying to turn <laughs> it into something more. That's actually online webtoon. Also, that's I've been I've started serializing that. Very see what, funny. See, see what I mean about repurposing yeah, things? Yeah, that's great. Go on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, anyways, uh, remember the old Warren Ellis forum? Yes, of course. The the yeah. engine. Yeah, um, the engine. Yeah. Well, after um, Action Philosophers had hit, I was trying to get – I that was my first real thing. I'd worked on the fringes of comics, but I never really, you know, um, had a series or had, like, you know, clout, really. I'd colored some things, and I'd worked for Wizard and stuff like that, but I'd never been, like, a, you know, real published artist. And so I was going to look for more work, and I went to the Warren Ellis Forum, and I guess I made – I made a pitch saying I was looking for work and I guess all these people thought I was looking to draw their ideas for free and uh, got inundated with like pitch after pitch after pitch and I just had to go up and like stop I made a mistake um, but I actually looked at the pitches and two of them were really great and one was from Justin Jordan um, who I knew from uh, you know the writer of Luther Strode absolutely go on for Luther Strode um, and the other one was from this guy, Grady Hendrix. And, um, I really liked it, but I didn't think I was the right artist for it. And I also didn't have time to draw something for free. So we kind of struck up an online friendship and, uh, I met him, you know, and then he came to, it turned out he was in New York and I met him at New York comic con, I think 2007 or 2008. He just came up to the table and we started chatting and we stayed in touch. And then, you know, he had mentioned that his wife had was a chef and had a restaurant, and then like they had this offer for a book deal, and she didn't want to do a regular cookbook. She thought it was boring, and I apparently they had a big fight over it. And uh, one, and during the fight, one of them shouted, "You might as well just do a comic book cookbook." And they both just stopped, and the, the fighting stopped. Like, Great idea. We have to do this. And so they tried. They worked with one artist. She didn't work out because she was overseas. And they wanted somebody local. So Grady just said, hey, do you know any cartoonists? And for like about 10 minutes, 10 seconds, I thought of other people. I'm like, no, I want to draw this thing. This sounds awesome. So, um, you know, drawing nonfiction cooking cookbook, which is yeah, like, yeah. you know, real cookbook. And uh, which was something that was when we realized that Action Philosophers was like it would work, um, was something I wanted to do. I'm like, you know, we could do any nonfiction thing. And I was like, a cookbook would be awesome. But now but I didn't have time to do it myself. Um, I'm an, a pretty avid home cook. I put myself through college as a chef, not a chef, but a, like a line cook. Oh, no and, kidding. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so that's something I always I thought would be great because it's something I knew a lot about. And now all of a sudden this chef is coming to me with a book deal saying, hey, let's draw a comic book cookbook. I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, that's how it worked. But then it took us about a year and a half from there to you do know, it. Fred and I and he needed to do a 10 page comic, like a pilot comic. To convince the publisher that this was a good idea, <laughs> which they generously, Grady and Amanda generously paid me to do. Oh, that's um, really cool. It was great. But yeah. So we did a 10 page like proof of concept and then sent it off. And uh, yeah, we got the deal. You know, I was talking to Fred about um, what you just said in terms of any nonfiction subject could be turned uh -huh. into a comic book and stuff. So yeah, you oh, know, sure. yeah, yeah, I'm really interested in that and I and obviously Fred told me about that from the writer's perspective and yeah, tell me as an artist and stuff because I do agree and you guys did kind of prove this with the start of Action Philosophers and all these projects the two of you have done together. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, you know, I mean, and it's so funny I mean, too because you go back to We weren't to, the first. Well, you know, I was going to say, go back to Will Eisner, obviously, with P.S. Sure. And the, what he did with, if people don't know the story, and I'm sure they do, but Ar Army, uh, Army How To, uh, you know, uh, booklets in terms of, you know, the way to, you know, how to clean your rifle or whatever. Yeah. They were boring as sin and, and the servicemen just didn't care and weren't really reading them and not paying attention to the stuff. And Eisner's like, well, put it in comic book form, make it yeah. entertaining, and, and it might sink in. And of course it did. Yeah. Yeah. And you can pack up, pack in so much more information in a comic, in one page of a comic than you can, if you know what you're doing, than if, than, uh, you can on just a 
dry text or even just pictures. Absolutely. Um, cause you're, it's sort of the, you, you're like sort of with people don't realize this with comics sometimes is you're pushing both sides of the, of your thinking, your brain together when you're reading a comic, it is right brain and it is left brain and it's interactive. So your whole brain is engaged when you're reading a comic. And if you put in nonfiction information, you're going to retain it so much better than if, even if somebody showed you or, you know, in front of your face, um, cause you're an active participant in more so than any other kind of reading. Understood. Absolutely. So I don't know. when you're doing, no, I, I think you explained it. That's, very there's, well. there's my, you know, there's, there's my nonfiction comics evangelism. Yes. We're the, form, we're the superior form of learning. <laughs> well, Neil, you know, Neil Gaiman said the same thing, but he said it with an English yeah. accent. So it sounds much more, you know, impressive. When yeah, Neil yeah, my, says it. my Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> so how much in term like i mean when you're doing like let's get back to the comic book history of comics uh uh-huh. you know i mean like the gags i mean beyond the information and stuff you know sometimes you gotta you're the one that's carrying a lot of the weight and oh, taking thanks. nothing away from fred because obviously oh. fred's doing a lot of great gag writing and 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 yes and, and non-fiction writing as well but yeah tell me about that process between the two of you guys Oh, well, I mean, the process is we're pretty hands off with each other. I mean, we, you know, we get along well and we have a very similar sense of humor. So I know like he's going to, I know he's going to write something that I'm going to think is funny. And, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to try to make it as fun, you know, say, aha, I can, I can top that and, you know, try to make it even funnier when it, when it comes through. And, uh, my tendency is to just draw, make things look ridiculous no matter what it is. And I guess it works. I don't know. It's hard for me to be serious with, with when Fred has written, you know, putting a whole put a whole bunch of jokes in. <laughs> is it, I don't know. <laughs> well, does there's not really not much of a process, John. I'm okay. sorry. There's no mystery or like anything. It's it's just Fred writes a whole script, and I just draw it as what I think is the best way it can it can be. Okay. And how do you ever like? Hey, how about if we did it this way and you know made it you know or oh sure or add, what, add I, a joke to the whatever Fred has already written. In oh it. yeah, that happens, but I don't even ask him. I just put it in. That's cool. And, and uh, you know, and it comes in and then, you know, I don't, I can't remember a time when he, you know, when we've shut each other, the other one down, you know, anytime we can add in something funny, we do it. Very cool. Um, so, you Excellent. know, and I guess, you know, some people would not appreciate, don't appreciate that approach, but you know, it works for us. Well, and again, how many years have you guys been doing this? When was Action Philosophers? That was the first one, right? 2000, I mean... We actually actually working on it was 2002, wow. but published publish was 2005 because we had the shorts. We were doing like one or two once in a while, and they popped up in like various anthologies. But self, the, we got the grant from the Zurich Foundation, which allowed us to self publish, which was like 2000, late 2004, and it hit the stands in 2005. You know, you are, are likely the first Zurich Foundation recipient that I've ever spoken to, and that's great. Oh, really? For people who don't know, explain what the Zurich Foundation is. The Zurich grant. Foundation was, it's no longer yes. around, um, Peter Laird of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fame took a lot of his turtle money and started this foundation called the Zurich Foundation, which gave grants to um, comic book creators to publish their own projects. And uh, I think they gave out grants every six months and you could apply and um, they would give you money to self publish your comic book. And this is, we got, I think we got it in uh, one of the last few years where they were offering it. Um, they, they since they no longer offer grants for comic book publishing, but uh, yeah, a lot of people got, uh, got their first projects um, through that. I know Adrian Tom- Tomine. Yes. That at Zurich grant. Um, I'm trying to think of some other people. Um, it, nothing springs to mind, but yeah, no a lot of, yeah, a lot of, a lot of like the, um, late nineties, early to, you know, late nineties, uh, yeah. tunes that sprung out, especially the independent scene got their start by got, getting a grant from the Zero Foundation. Yeah, it was really, I, what a, what a really great thing. I mean, that's the thing. I think Eastman and Laird, uh, we all give it up to them for creating the turtles, but then for yeah. Laird to go to that extra step, especially back <laughs> then, because that was really in the infancy, even pre-infancy maybe of web comics and, oh, for and, sure, yeah. and and that's the thing. And I think likely because of the development of web comics, the need wasn't there the way it was in that hard publishing era, pre pre digital yeah. era and stuff. And that's likely one of the, I, I always assume that it's like, well, you know, people can kind of do their own thing now and and gather an audience without mm-hmm. the help of of things like the Zurich uh, Grant. Yeah, but you're right. Thing. Yeah, the, in the pre internet days, there were, it was it was a tough. It was tough sure. to make a you know get a name for yourself or or get noticed. Absolutely, um, 
it still is, you know, even with, you know, the proliferation of web comics, it's, it's hard. Did you, it's in, incredibly hard. <laughs> did you get to talk directly to Laird about this or, or, no, we never did. I think I did see, I, uh, I, one time we were at a convention together and I really wanted to talk to him, but he just had a huge line of people. Sure. Just what I just couldn't, couldn't make it through. Um, yeah. And, but on the other side, also his, you know, co-creator Kevin Eastman did a lot at that time. I mean, he started Tundra Publishing, which was basically yes. just, tw- you know, a way, which was like the flip side. It was a way for, um, the established professionals to do like dream projects and a lot of cool stuff came out of that too. Yes. And Kevin that, can- that went around, went away quickly. Yeah, yes, like big numbers. Like exactly, numbers. big numbers. Alan Moore and Bill Sienkiewicz comes to mind. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, Tundra was very cool. No, that's the thing, man. I, I really, like, they are, and I'll admit it, not a big Turtles fan. Appreciated the Underground yeah. book when it was coming out and was too old to give a damn about the Saturday morning cartoons. Cause <laughs> I was out trying to get yeah. late at Friday night, so I wasn't watching yeah. the Saturday morning cartoons back then. But, again, two really good guys that made a ton of money and really gave back to the community and, yeah. and and that's the thing. And I, and I love when Eastman is set up at cons. It doesn't happen that often, but I've seen him a few times and couldn't be more of a down to earth guy. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, had heavy metal, bought, bought and was publishing heavy metal for, for a number of years as well. So, yeah. I mean, you know, these are these are good guys that gave back. So I, I that's it was the thing. funny. Um, when I was in college, my studio mate, um, I studied illustration and I one of my one of the people in my studio uh, was a design major who was from Northampton, Massachusetts, and her summer internship was with Kevin Eastman. Wow. <laughs> and uh, told me stories about how, how, this, how he would just, like, you know, th- she was helping run Tundra and, um, you know, doing graphic design work and paste-up work on, during the summer. And she's like, you know, Kevin would just come in one day with a motorcycle and just say, look what I got, you know. So <laughs> those, guys did, those guys did pretty well from what, I, you know, the stories I heard from her. Yeah, but always, you know, stayed grounded and are pretty, you know, yeah. for having as much money as they do, down to earth guys they did and some everything. Good, yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they took care of themselves, but it sounds like, but they also, they definitely took care of, gave back quite a lot. Very, very cool, man. Excellent. Well, listen, man, I, uh, I am really happy that uh, the comic book history of comics is coming back now in full color. Yes. Uh, and, and again, the title, I want to give the title properly because people want to order this. So, yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, I don't know when you're going to get this out, but the final order cutoff is Halloween. Well, but that's just, actually, I'm going to spin yeah. this today. So, uh, okay, awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, something I talked to you and I talked to Ryan Brown, or, uh-huh. or rather, not Ryan Brown, uh, Ryan, Riley Brown. Riley, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to uh, get, uh, I'm like, well, you know, you're, they're both con- co- uh, collaborating with Fred. Um, mm-hmm. And also, I happen to see that uh, the cutoff was Halloween. So I really did want to get this out there uh, yeah. a, a few days ahead so people have a chance to go to their store and go, hey, uh, order this for me. If you have yes. not read the comic book history of comics, it is fantastic. I love the original black and white uh, release that the guys did. Then I bought the IDW original collection and and cannot be more happy about, could not be happier that the uh, the new color version is coming with added material, her story being part of it as well. So uh, women will get their due in the new expanded version that will be 12 months and then likely either one big volume or two or two volumes, depending on how IDW wants it, to cut this. It looks up. like it's going to be two volumes. Okay, very so cool. So they're going to split it up. Yep. Excellent. No, it's very, very funny, very informative. I mean, that's the great thing. I really, you guys do this with action philosophers and action presidents as well. Uh, it's edutainment. It literally is information that you will learn and that will surprise you in some cases. Uh, I think uh, the breakdown in terms of what was happening with uh, publishing and uh, where everybody was and the the various moves yeah. that the publishers made and the various movements that happened within comics. You guys did a great job in that uh, oh. initial run. Absolutely. And I look forward to Thanks, John. the expansion. Oh, dude, please. I, I You know, honestly, and it was yeah, really, it, it was kind of a, 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 um, a, a yearly tradition where when I was still doing floor interviews at conventions, I'd check in with you guys and we'd talk yeah. about, you know, the comic book history of comics I as think it was this, coming out. Yeah, I think this is the first time we've, uh, done this over the phone. It's true. In fact. I don't, I'm pretty sure we've only done it at shows. Live at shows, but, absolutely, man. No, yeah. and that's why and that's it, been one of the one of the best parts of of doing these series, doing all these nonfiction series, is connecting with people that are enthusiastic for the material, not just comics, and just you know all you know people that I would probably would have never talked to at a comic convention, but were always there have approached us because we've been putting out this, these, this kind of material. And it's, that's been one of the best parts. Well, dude, it's, it's left of center. I think, you know, people, people come in for their, their, uh, 
their meat and potatoes comic book interests and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And this is the kind of thing that might slip by if they don't know. And that's why it was always uh, an imperative for me to check in with you guys and say, no, no, no. I know you know Fred from his Hulk work and maybe Hercules <laughs> or whatever, but this is really cool. And also, long time coming, right? Because I've always been a fan of your art ever since oh, I've thanks, become man. aware of it. Absolutely, man. And you do such interesting projects. So it's it's great to finally do talk to you directly. And that was the thing, too, because I, I know uh, in the case of both uh, – uh, you guys and also Riley as well. And say, like, oh, let's mm-hmm. get you know me and Fred together. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I want to talk to everybody separately because I want uh-huh. I want to give you guys a chance to to you know say your own piece about it and stuff. Oh, thanks. And, and again, long time coming that you and I finally have this conversation. So. Yeah, it has been. So no, hey, thanks and uh, and really good luck with the uh, the re release of the comic book history of comics through to IDW again. That cutoff is on Halloween, so move your ass yeah. to your uh, your local store and order it because don't wait for it to come out because really. Uh, stores need to be aware, and uh, these guys deserve that kind of attention. And also, again, uh, line line webtoons dot com. Line well webtoons dot webtoons dot com, and the comic is called Polydiacy. Polydiacy, very cool. And then also uh, the, uh, the the uh, the Tiny group. Dick Adventures. Tiny Dick Adventures. Looking for group dot com. Looking which for written group. by okay. Brian Somer. Yeah. Excellent. Looking for group dot com to find Tiny Dick Adventures. Excellent stuff. Yep. And uh, and yeah, no, I'm I'm always interested in what you're doing, right? So uh, anytime Thanks. you got a new project, uh, let me know, and uh, we'll do this again. I might let you know sooner than you think. There you go, two neat guys, uh, Riley Brown and Ryan Dunleavy, and uh, you know they're both working with Fred Van Lenty, and Fred is due to come back as well. Weird Detective is just wrapping up, and uh, man, he's doing interesting stuff. Generation Zero for Valiant, uh, writing slapstick with Riley for Marvel. And a couple other neat projects as well. So I'm always happy to welcome Fred Van Lenty back. Count on it happening in the days ahead, likely in November, here on Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for listening today. It was brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. Some other great books that you can get from InStock Trades. Things like The Flash by Jeff Johns, book three, including uh, some interesting, uh, you know, uh, contacts with uh, Gorilla Grodd, uh, Hawkman. And, of course, we'll get the secret history of Professor Zoom. Jeff Johns and Rich Burkett, uh, among uh, the uh, great artists that are involved in this uh, collection from uh, DC, The Flash, Jeff Johns, book three, 50% off, $12.49. You can get X-Men 92, volume one, World is a Vampire. That's uh, Chad Bowers and Chris Sims writing. Attili uh, Fermancia, okay, if the, and I'm sorry if I'm saying his name wrong. This continues that Chris Claremont what if uh, timeline, and uh, they do a very interesting job with the book. Let's see, we've got uh, the world is a vampire. This is trade paperback volume one, and it's fifty percent off. It's just seven dollars and ninety nine cents. You can get the six gun trade paperback volume nine. Boot Hill, Cullen Bunn, and Brian Hurt's excellent uh, series. Uh, this, of course, is the last chapter in their amazing run. It's 30% off, just $13.99. You can get Eternal Warrior, Wrath of the Eternal Warrior, Volume t- uh, 2, uh, the trade paperback Labyrinth, and that's uh, Robert Vendetti and Raul Allen uh, doing the work. And let's see, it is 30% off, $13.99. What else have we got? How about Get Jiro, of course, Blood and Sh- Sushi, Anthony Bourdain, Joel Rose, uh, Dave Johnson doing the cover. Uh, interesting stuff. It's the prequel to Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And uh, this one, let's see, is uh, 45% off. It's just $8.24. And as I said earlier, you can get the hardcover of The Fade Out at a great price. Uh, Ed Brubaker, uh, Betty Brewweister, Brightweister, Brightweiser, sorry, Sean Phillips. Sorry about that, Betty. And uh, this is 400 pages, 45% off, $27.49. Great noir, old Hollywood story from uh, Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips, and Betty Brightweiser. The fade out. Pretty neat stuff. And it's waiting for you at InStockTrades.com, along with a hell of a lot more. If you just search your favorite artist or your fa- favorite writer, you're going to find great books at great prices. Don't forget, if your orders are $50 or more, you'll receive free shipping from InStockTrades.com. Thanks again for listening to Word Balloon today. we got more great stuff coming for you in November. October was a great month, and uh, the hits just keep coming next month as well. Right on to, into December and into 2017. Cannot wait to share some of the amazing conversations in store for you and me 
on Word Balloon coming up in the weeks ahead. I hope you'll be here to join us. Thanks again for listening. Make sure you tell your friends about Word Balloon uh, because I think it's one of the more unique comic book podcasts that are out there. And I'm glad that you uh, are still here listening to it and uh, paying attention to my nonsense. More coming up in the days ahead. Thanks for listening. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions. Copyright 2016.